Hi, welcome back to Core Reads and the traditional territory of the Tawasin First Nation. Uh, today we are getting into the negotiator and this is part five and Darcy and I had like the longest conversation we've had so far about this one before we started recording because as conflict geeks this is our favorite. This is the best part. <laughs> and we're not sure yet. I mean Part six could also be really good, but it has a lot to top this I don't know how you beat this. This, top is, this, this, is, this is so the bar. As like the super conflict dorks we are, I loved this chapter. Well, this part, I guess. And it's funny because uh, I actually had one of my kids be like, are you yelling at your book again, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> you know it needs to be done once I, in a while. Well, and, and so let's, let's start right there because this was the really fascinating piece is that... Um, the, the two characters that are really negotiating the future of humanity um, are having this moment where like one of them doesn't think like us and can't, can't get there. Yeah. And the other is like super emotional and has talked already about like the fact that he's really emotional and trying not to be afraid and he's talking about how it's clouding his thinking. And so we have the answer yeah. as the readers long before they get to it. Pages ahead. There's like chapters. We get, yeah, we get, basically, I think it's right at the beginning of the part. We basically get, here are the rules. And that means you know the solution. And the whole rest of the time, we're going, you can, you can, you can do it. No, don't, that's a, that's a bad train of thought. Don't do that. Go back here. <laughs> um, and it's, and it's interesting because also you, you start to see the danger in the only solution. Right? So this set of rules as laid out has one solution and this huge future danger. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's fascinating, right? Like you, like in having only one solution, you're also going to cause a fracturing of the other side. Right? And this is, it's funny because like we talked about how, how it relates to lots of other things and then I was, you know, thinking about it for a moment and it, it reminds me of union negotiations a little bit. Mm. This moment where, like, the person that's representative is, like, pretty congenial, right? Like, they're, they comport yeah. themselves well, they can have a real conversation with the other side, right? From both, from both management and the union. But then they have to take this and they have to sell it back. Yeah. And the selling it back is really hard. Yeah. And it can be, it doesn't matter if it's the only solution, if the other side doesn't like it. You can't sell it back. And so those sorts of moments of like, help me, like help me create something that allows me to sell back yeah. this idea, right? That kind of, I'm on your side stuff, yeah. you know, and it's more extreme than it is in that union place. But like the other side is fractured. The other side has extremists yeah. in both directions. Yeah. Help me sell it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's always really interesting because it is something, you know, that we know mediations will cause agreements to fall apart yeah. right because there's other stakeholders and the other stakeholders have to be sold on the outcome yeah. and so it's like where is that justification and so yeah well and, and, and I want to tag on to that because if we also get to see the we're entering this negotiation in totally good faith but no one's ever actually come up with a solution other than this one and so that's the one we're expecting to uh, negotiate to um, so if you could just negotiate to that, that'd be great. Well, uh, no, really, there's just this one way. I, I'm not sure why we're still talking. There's one solution here. It's the one um, that I've proposed. It is the annihilation of humanity. Yeah, that's, of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, of course you will get your chance to seek appropriate justice and ensure that we're not like missing something, but we're not. But here, here's our process, and we have so much power mm -hmm. that your only option is to buy into our process. Yes. And, you know, it, being in, in Canada in this moment, <laughs> our minds went straight to, like, Indigenous people in the Canadian courts. Yeah. Right? Because it's... Science fiction always happens to, like, mirror some of the most interesting and, like, morally conflicted things going on in societies. <laughs> I, I take issue with the term happens. It does because on purpose, but, <laughs> but also, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's the, the us, this big powerful entity have come together, come up with a justice system that is super just and reasonable. It's, 
There's absolutely nothing about it that could be unjust, even though it always ends in us murdering a millions and millions and billions of people. But that's fine, because we did it for good reasons, and we're good people, and um, actually, they we're just going to still work within this framework, and uh, you have no, you have no leverage here. Your only opportunity is to use our framework, yeah. and then when you use it in a way that was unexpected, we we're really upset, and we now think about changing the framework. Yeah, we're, well, I'm, 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 you know, we're only going to change the framework, you know, in a very just and normal manner, but we are going to change it and try and, uh, like, mm -hmm. and 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 it's all about the maintenance of power. Right? So the biggest fear is yeah. becoming not the most powerful. Yeah. Right? Like that is that's the fear driver. And so it is a maintaining of power. And this justice framework is to make us feel good about our maintaining of power. Yeah. Right? And it really is a moral salve for our maintenance of power. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is very interesting. And 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 there's a lot of talk and we kind of all the way building up, there's 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 sort of three key pieces that come up in uh, our, our main character's historical writing, because we, we still get his nonfiction stuff, um, where, he, where he is writing that, you know, there are, I believe he said, three things that, that cause wars. Fear, greed, and grievances. And we very quickly are told, okay, so that, if you can just figure out which thing it is, it'll solve the problem. And then we get kind of the answer. And I don't think the the problem's not just solved because you understand why war was a problem. Well, it, it's interesting, right? Like he talks yeah. about it earlier. This is the key. The yeah. why is the key. But it it's like the key to like opening the door to start, yeah. not to the solution. Yeah, which it's, <laughs> I, I would have said that like the first four parts, it's like when we get the key, we will open the solution. And it was like, eh, that's not the solution. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the door to where the solution might be hidden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In a swamp, across yeah, exactly. some firestorm. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Here is your puzzle box. I, yeah, no, that that piece was 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 quite fascinating. So the the we really really loved this section. So we really want to talk about talk about it a lot. But I think we should move on to the one other um, kind of major thing, which is we don't see the aliens at all. We don't see the aliens. We don't see the spaceship. Um, we maybe see a chair. We're actually not confident it's a chair. <laughs> I, I love this like <laughs> use of like you know little little bit of literary smoke and mirrors, um, and you know like it would have been great to see the aliens. Yeah. But not seeing them is is really powerful. I think partly because we're so visual as humans, and so because we don't see them, we don't focus on their visualization or what their bodies mean or anything like that. And so it saves us to think about like their civilization as a bigger unit yeah. and not to focus on their like embodiment and physicality. Well, and, and we have what I would say are a couple of hints, which I think are interesting because we do know that there are dis distinct thought beings and we know that they can perceive humans as distinct and meaningful life forms. And some of my angry writing is around what counts as a species to them because they, they make some claims that suggest that they're completely incapable of understanding, you know, bacteria as a living being. So I believe that I have discovered a certain subset of qualities of these aliens, which of course I want to know because I'm also a big nerd and I'm like, tell me more about the aliens. Um, but I think we get these little hints that I wish, I hope, they show up in the next part, that we get the little, I know stuff about them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, their spaceships have walls in them. That doesn't tell you anything. They seem to need some kind of apparatus that's chair-like. They, yeah, they <laughs> might use seatbelts. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> or something. Right? Like, so so there, there's those yeah. pieces, but because it's all dark, Part of me in my head was like, maybe this is just a hallucination. Yeah. Right? Like maybe he, you know, it's just like telepathic conversation straight into his brain, just a hallucination. Yeah. And there's, while that's probably not actually what the author intended, it's there cool. is that seed of doubt there, right? Like it's just like, we don't actually know what happened. We're just getting 
uh, mind interpretation in a dark room of what had happened. And so, like, yeah, he's hearing a voice, right? But for all we know, none of the aliens have ever come to Earth, and this spaceship is unmanned, and this conversation is happening over billions of millions of light years. Yeah, and we just we have we have no knowledge that there's aliens in it. I mean, they do answer his questions about, like, are there aliens on this ship? And they sure. do say yes. But, but they also haven't been super trustworthy. Yeah, we, we don't know they're not lying. We never see from their perspective. Right. And, and some of their language, I mean, we're assuming they're truthful in their language, and we don't know enough. And they're confident that they're not flawed in their language, but we're, we, we shouldn't assume, I think, that words we use to mean things about humans are relevant to this alien form. Are you all on here? Well, we all can see in there, maybe, or we're all able to think in that spaceship. So yeah, there's totally people on board. Our, our life essence or the thing that could snuff us out isn't there. Maybe. maybe. We don't know. Can, can you die? Are you immortal? I mean, there are things like that. Like, yeah. you, you will live for a very long time. Well, how do you keep somebody alive for a very long time? Like, there's, there's sort of funny stuff in there about, you know, what they may or may not be. Um, and yet, the conversation that's had is in English, yeah. in a back and forth that feels like it's between, like, two old history profs. Yes. Right. And this, you know, lots of, like, questioning about, like, what the role of history is and how dangerous not having good history is. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I, I find lots of those pieces really interesting and that kind of the back stories that we hear about, like why why this this group of, of beings is motivated in this way yeah. is really fascinating. And it pulls us into this conversation about, about what happens to us when we are in conflict. Yeah. And when the conflict goes on and what it does to people and does to like conscious beings in that space of, you know, it brings us to the lowest level, yeah. right? And we often behave in ways that we're not proud of in conflict. And often we behave in ways that if the other side did them, it would be evil. Yes. Right, and what does that mean? And so there can be this, this other people did this thing and it was evil and therefore we do this thing. And it's super different. And it's really different and yet it's the same. <laughs> it's really different because we did it second. <laughs> <laughs> we were provoked or we have this reasoning and it really is that, you know, like intent versus impact. Yeah. Right? And really getting in there like our intentions are positive intentions. Therefore, this thing that we're doing that from the outside looks evil is okay. And their impact was awful and therefore they're evil. And so that and I'm and I'm curious because that discussion, it's like it's seated for them in, in this chapter, right? This like, how are you different than what was done to you, yeah. right? Like, this is your story, and this is something we see come up in these like long drawn out conflicts, yeah. where people are inflicting on the other side that which was inflicted on them, and yet trying to claim somehow that these are different, yeah. right? That there's like, you know, they're the same in impact yet somehow different in character, yeah. And I think there's one other piece, because they start it at the end, that we kind of just want to touch on, and that is what the characteristics of memory are, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And like what matters about memory, and like this, and, and there's some assumptions made in this book, and maybe it's that memory doesn't go back far enough, but that like who you are today mm -hmm. is somehow divorced from your memories of the things that have made you the person you are today, or not, right? Like how much are your memories yeah. a piece of like who you are as a person, yeah. right? And is there a difference between like memory and essence? And the author seems to have an opinion about that. Yeah. And we see how that plays out a little bit. Um, and we're kind of, we get that sort of the hints at the beginning of this, like what does it mean? And what does memory mean? And uh, a few little kind of hints around that. There are some, I think, suggestions too about, um, you know, they, they, there's some talk about where memory is stored in, the, in brains and stuff, but I'm interested in the way that that might connect to, you know, memories might form identities or do experiences form identities. If you don't remember an experience, can it still be part of your formative 
experiences? Maybe. Well, it, I think it, it, we're well, going to find out. It's an interesting thing because, in, like, you know, in, in a lot of the counseling literature, there's a huge difference for, for counseling for trauma that is before language is developed and after language is developed, right? Like, yeah. these two things are very, very different, right? And, like, that sort of, like, embodied reactivity to things that you don't remember happening yeah. but are still, like, formative for you and, like, the phobias and how you have to handle those two pieces so differently is really something that now we get to potentially explore. Well, and, and okay, so I was going to not continue, but I do have one other thing that now <laughs> I want to say, which is just a, this section and maybe even part four, I don't believe we saw from anyone else's point of view, but there were certain chapters in earlier um, parts that were from other characters' perspectives. I'm very curious if we're going to get more of that and possibly like I would love a this is what someone who was a child during this experience this is their version of that history or something so I'm, I'd be very curious I don't know what we're going to get but if we get like a diary of you know th when I was seven and the spaceship came to earth the fanfic <laughs> for this book will be the writing about like <laughs> yeah. what it what it's an experience of to be a person living through this without the actual knowledge. Without the knowledge or the power to be part right. of the decisions, right? This is this is very much the room where it happens. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> but I'm very curious how how much access we will have to the point of view of even even other characters who have had POV before. There's um, there's a uh, the the art the CIA guy. We had one chapter from his perspective, I'd love to hear what he thinks. Yeah, and we seem to have had kind of one motivational from each of our kind of core characters. Yeah, I'm curious. Right? Yeah. About like, that kind of, it's like a memory that helps identify them. Yeah. Right, and, and it's a memory that they use, and so it's interesting that we've tied back into memory here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's it. That, that's <laughs> it. We're done. We're done. Uh, we'll probably keep talking when we turn the camera off, but um, you can keep talking to us by going to the things on this card that I'm going to show, because now I know that that card exists. Um, find us on Twitter. Come join our discussion. Uh, on September 13th, we're going to have an online discussion, and we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you, you can tell us what we missed, uh, what, what part of the negotiator was your favorite, and why it's your favorite part of the book. <laughs> or is. where we're wrong, even though that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be very interesting. So. Uh, let us know, and we'll see you there. Absolutely. Next week, the historian. Let's find out. <laughs>